it's a, it's a great privilege for me to uh, welcome to Keys Professor Nancy Reed, Professor of Statistics at the University of Toronto. I, I can't do justice in a, a brief introduction to the academic honors that Professor Reed has received, but I'll just mention that she is a fellow of the Royal Society. She is an officer of the Order of Canada and a recipient of the uh, Guy Medal in Gold of the Royal Statistical Society. Uh, in addition to the wide-ranging uh, impact and influence of her mathematical work, uh, she's also recognized as, um, uh, as taking leadership roles, as having uh, served the worldwide uh, statistical community, and indeed as a, as a role model for future generations of statisticians. So we're absolutely delighted that she could join us today to give the first contribution in our meeting on Fisher in the 21st century, and she will talk about Fisher's contributions to mathematical statistics. Well, thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning to those online, or good night, depending where you are. So um, it was easy to choose my title because I went down to the basement of our home and found this very large book. Uh, not a green screen, but an actual large book, <laughs> uh, it, it, which says contributions to mathematical statistics. So I decided to um, confine myself to a small selection of articles from that book and, and discussing his contributions which has two benefits. It's um, a topic I know reasonably well, and it's um, entirely uncontroversial, I hope. <laughs> Almost uncontroversial. It's, it's a little, well, I don't need to for this audience, but for my students who never buy books, I was trying to convey an idea of how big the book is. So I took several photographs, but it didn't quite work, so maybe that gives a better idea of how large it is. And uh, my husband, Donald Fraser, studied Fisher um, extensively in his youth. We didn't talk about it much, but he did spend a lot of time on Fisher. And you can see that he's carefully marked uh, the papers that he thought would be most interesting. I think he invented these stickies because they are not the kind that we're accustomed to using today. Uh, and and uh, never got the message that you're not supposed to write in books, obviously. But when I turned the page of one of Fisher's most famous books, I found uh, a lot of writing on it, which you can see somewhat to the left there. Um, and it was kind of like having a conversation with Don again about, about his work through his writing. Um, I, I feel in a way I should have called the, really the topic theoretical statistics. I don't think it helps us to think of it as mathematical statistics particularly, although perhaps that's uh, uh, a, a small point on which to disagree with a topic, but um, it's, uh, statistics is a lot different from mathematics. It needs a, a healthy interplay between theory and applications. And in David Cox's words, theory means foundations, not the theoretical analysis of specific techniques, which our journals abound with. So in some sense, at some point in a statistician's life, one has to think about the foundations. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary describes foundations as a solid base on which rests a large structure. And I gave a talk on this topic in Hong Kong, and I found this lovely photograph of a solid base and a large structure on top. Um, but uh, David Cox's point, again, it must be continually tested against new applications. And in fact, uh, Fisher said the same thing. Um, he said the practical application of general theorems is a different art from their establishment by mathematical proof. Uh, and I found this picture on Twitter showing the, the, um, the foundation as being not very solid. There's a lot to study in the foundations of statistics and it's not sorted out yet. But it really, um, everything we're studying is everything Fisher studied. And this is 100 years after his, his first main publication on the foundations of theoretical statistics. And uh, reading the paper today, it's, it's astonishing. Um, 
It's astonishing because everything, everything we teach our undergraduates is in that paper, more or less. But I think it takes a lifetime before you see that it's in that paper, or a lot of study, maybe not a lifetime, but it is statistic and parameter, the distinction between summary of the data and a parameter of a mathematical model that the data, that summary is meant to capture was clarified in this paper. Um, the notion of estimation of this parameter using your statistic and then its properties, consistency, sufficiency, efficiency, all these words that we're so familiar with now in assessing the properties of our methods, assessing our foundations really. He defined the likelihood function and the maximum likelihood estimate and the Fisher information, uh, which he also called intrinsic accuracy. Um, in 1925, he, he wrote almost the same paper again, but better. Um, he, he had all of the above and much more clearly set out, um, it, it, along with an algorithm for computing maximum likelihood estimators, um, a discussion of the loss of information and its recovery using ancillary statistics, which we almost, that last bit, we almost don't teach our students because it's too hard. <laughs> and then in 1934, um, he carried the, the last bit a little bit further, the ancillary statistic, discussing conditional inference, uh, location models, uh, recovery of information using ancillaries, exponential family, um, distribution of the sufficient estimate, even talked about uniformly most powerful tests, which I was quite surprised at because that, that's a kind of name and person um, discussion. And, but this was 1934, Neyman and Pearson's paper was in 1933. So I think Fisher wasn't quite as violently opposed to their approach uh, at that point as it became later. And at the end of the uh, two new properties paper, the 34 paper, he has a summary where he makes seven points. And really, again, those seven points, it's just astounding. It was astounding to me, even though I'd read Fisher as a younger statistician, to see uh, how clearly he thought, but also that before he thought this out, there wasn't anything. That is, it just really invented um, the subject that I've been studying my whole career. So I'll, I'll put this in a little bit more modern language because we want to bring Fisher into the 21st century. So I have a little bit of mathematics coming up, I'll warn you, but you don't need to read it really. Um, but the, the um, likelihood function is simply a function of the parameter, theta, that's the unknown quantity, uh, and it's proportional to the probability of the data that we've observed. So it's, it's simply switching the arguments of the function from left to right and right to left to emphasize that it's a function of the parameter with the data held fixed. And the maximum likelihood estimator is the, est the, the value of theta that maximizes the likelihood function in theta. And that's a somehow, Fisher defined that as a sufficient estimate for the unknown parameter. Uh, we don't just want estimates, we need to know some measure of uncertainty. And it's a, one of the strengths of statistical science in general is that the data that gives you your estimate also gives you a measure of how good your estimate is. And Fisher defined this in terms of the, what's now called the Fisher information, which is just the curvature of the log of the likelihood function, typically evaluated at the maximum point. And he also showed that in large samples, which were left somewhat vague, that theta hat, the estimate of the parameter, could be expected to follow a normal distribution with a center at the right value, theta, and variance estimated by the observed Fisher information. So we have our estimate, we have its asymptotic standard error, and we know its distribution. So in some sense, we've Fisher's words, they solved the problem of estimation because we can take theta hat plus or minus and we have some notion of how well we've estimated our parameter. Uh, so this, this page just repeats the two um, 
normal approximations that I showed you before, but and, and draws a little picture. And theta hat, of course, is right in the middle where the likelihood function is maximized, or the log likelihood function. And I've showed the two, um, two inferences, one based on the theta hat being normal that I just described. Uh, it's called the Wald test, although it's in Fisher 22. Uh, that's um, Stigler's law of eponymy that nothing is named after him, the original inventor. Um, and so Stigler probably didn't think it up, right? Um, <laughs> uh, so that I've showed the Wald test. You can see that it, it starts at the MLE. And if we wanted a confidence interval, we'd go plus or minus two standard errors. Uh, the other way to look at it is to come down from the top and see what the distribution is of that drop from the highest point of the likelihood to some critical point, and I've shown that in blue, and that's called the likelihood ratio test. And that's not in Fisher in this form, although it is the basis for the chi-squared goodness of fit test. I use data from a gamma shape distribution because that's the one that Fisher worked out, and uh, it has the property that you can express the maximum likelihood estimate as a function of the sum of the log of the observations. Um, that function is the derivative of the log gamma function. So Fisher had lots of fun with expansions and, and showing us clever arguments about um, uh, flipping around uh, uh, complicated expressions for the gamma function and all that special function theory. And you could just feel that he was a bit showing off, I think, when he was writing that. Um, he also was quite interested in finding the exact distribution because in large samples, how large is large enough? So he was, he was insistent on looking at the small sample distribution. Can we find the exact distribution of the maximum likelihood estimator? And uh, we almost can uh, in, in very special cases. The first was treated in Fisher 34, or the one I'm calling first, the other one he did actually in 25. Um, in a location model, that is, the data comes from a rather simple structure. There's just a single parameter. And uh, the, the only thing to estimate is the location of the known density function. And, and so this ancillary statistic that I mentioned before, you, you could um, take, as, take each observation and subtract off the maximum likelihood estimate. And he showed that that statistic has a distribution that's free of theta. So there's no information about theta in that statistic. And you can see that that's the case because we could add b to every y and, and then add b to theta hat, and we'd still get the same configuration. So there's no information about the location in that ancillary. That's been subtracted out. And he showed that you could get the exact distribution of theta hat conditional on that ancillary. That's on my next slide. What I didn't know was that he looked also at special case number two in uh, Fisher 25. And here the model looks a little bit more complicated, but it isn't really. It's, a, it's an exponential family model. And one of the crucial things about it is that the sufficient statistic, which I've called S, uh, enters the model as a linear combination of parameters in, in this uh, bilinear form that's uh, shown in just in the first term of the exponential. I don't want that. Um, and in this case, uh, the sufficient statistic is kind of matched to theta. Or another way to say it is that theta hat will be a function of the sufficient statistic. And, and that's important for statisticians because sufficiency means we've captured all the information about the parameter that's in the data. Um, Fisher said in the 25 paper, in the, even in the 22 paper, he said the maximum likelihood estimate was sufficient. That's not strictly correct. It's not always sufficient. Um, but the likelihood map is sufficient. That was proved much later, although he mentions that in passing, that the likelihood will only depend on the sufficient statistic. OK, so th what does the exact distribution look like? Well, in my special case one, we change our data to the MLE and that ancillary statistic. That's all the um, differences. And the exact distribution of theta hat conditional on that MLE is obtained exactly from the likelihood function. All you have to do is norm it and treat it as a function of theta. Well, of, it's a function of theta hat for given theta. Uh, 
but it's, it, it's exactly expressed by this likelihood function divided by the integral of the likelihood function so that it becomes a density and integrates to one. In the exponential family, we reduce the data to the sufficient statistic, and you can find the exact distribution of the sufficient statistic, almost, because the, um, we just have to take the original density that I started with and then integrate out all the y's that give the same s. Uh, that turns out to be a little bit messy, and Fisher wasn't, didn't try to do that, but he did express rather clearly how you might do that using the likelihood function. And the general case was gravitated towards much, much later. So this, my reference in the title bar is to the August 1980 issue of Biometrica, where there were four papers by Cox, Barndorf, Nielsen, Hinckley, and Durbin that all led to the same approximate distribution for the maximum likelihood estimator given an ancillary statistic in a general model, not in a special case one and not in special case two. And it almost looks like special case one because it has the log likelihood function and then the log likelihood function at its maximum. So this part, the numerator is the same. So really all the other stuff is just an approximation to the integral in the denominator and it's the Laplace approximation to that. So Fisher could have done it, but uh, he didn't. Um, and th that turns out to be accurate to order n to the minus three halves, and the large sample versions that I was showing you before are only accurate to order n to the minus one half. And if that seems a little bit obscure, it just means that these approximations tend to be really, 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 really good in relatively small samples. So to this high order of approximation, we know the distribution of the, the density function for the maximum likelihood estimator. Uh, how do we use it for inference? Well, uh, one thing to do is to find values of theta that are consistent with their observed data, and consistent will be measured by the amount of density uh, at, those, uh, at the observed data. So we'll change theta around. We'll go back to this formula and change theta around this, and we'll think of this as fixed. So we'll essentially pivot on, uh, on this density so that we can find values of theta that are consistent with our observed uh, maximum likelihood estimate and ancillary, or with our observed sufficient statistic. And that'll give us confidence intervals. We, we can work out p-values. We can find the probability uh, for some fixed theta naught of observing a result as or more extreme than our observed data, a notion also due to Fisher in a different 1925 paper, uh, actually in his book, I guess, uh, on design of experiments. Um, two questions, is it computationally feasible? That is, I've got this expression there, it doesn't look too bad, but it does require us to specify an expression for theta hat and an expression for A. And that turns out to be a little bit hard to do. So it's, people don't use this every day because they're not exactly sure how to use it. But with some study, it is definitely computationally feasible. Um, but it's also, I've developed it as if theta was our only parameter of interest. And in modern applications, even in not so modern, our models have many, many parameters, some of which we're interested in and some of which are nuisance parameters. And the first step, and this is uh, more modern than Fisher now, is to just maximize out those nuisance parameters. This is also on the next slide. So we have our parameter of interest and our nuisance parameters, and we concentrate the likelihood by just maximizing over the uh, nuisance parameter. Or if you like, um, we take our hill and we find a ridge along it and we, we, we use as our new likelihood function that curve uh, that we've defined by finding the maximum point everywhere along our space of the parameter of interest. And that sort of works. Um, you can use it on, uh, you can use the large sample theory and treat this profile log likelihood as we did 
the regular log likelihood, normal, and draw your curve, find your theta hat, go out this way or drop down from the top. That all works. The problem is the approximation can be quite poor. Sometimes if you're, likely, if you're lucky, you can isolate parameters in a marginal or a conditional distribution. In this example, I've showed isolating the parameter of interest in a conditional distribution. Um, so that's one version of lucky. Um, which Fisher also discovered, that's the basis for his exact test in two by two tables and other contingency tables. And then you could take the log of that red density function and treat that as your log likelihood function. It's not so easy to calculate in many examples. So it turns out though that you can approximate that conditional likelihood relatively simply by making an adjustment to the profile log likelihood. So I put this formula in gray for those of you who are not so familiar with tossing around letters and numbers and symbols and so on. But the point is that you start with the profile likelihood and you make a, an adjustment that's a little bit smaller but depends on the parameter of interest, it's high. And then to make it parameterization invariant, Warendorf Nielsen showed that you need to add another adjustment which is actually very complicated to work out. The first one is easy, the second one not so easy. Okay, so that's it. I'm still in the 20th century. I'm supposed to be talking about Fisher in the 21st century. Uh, and this, this was all done, well, through from 1980 to 2000, I would say. Um, so I thought, my first thought was, Okay, um, I want to talk about Fisher in the 21st century, and so obviously everything he did is going to inform every application of statistics ever. So I got out the journal of the Royal Statistical Society Series C, Applied Statistics, and started reading through each article, looking for references to Fisher, looking for references to likelihood and maximum likelihood, and I didn't find any. <laughs> I thought, oh my gosh, that's What's happening here? And so I thought about this for a while, and I thought, well, maybe I'm, I should look at more issues. Or, and I realized uh, I was not thinking in the right way. Um, I, I needed to have another look. So I asked my students in the class to find papers from 2020 or 2021 that mention likelihood or maximum likelihood or sufficiency or consistency and uh, wonderful students that they are. They came up with all kinds of things. I'm, I would say mostly in the theoretical journals, but not entirely, because they were asked to find one theory paper and one applied paper. So I actually think I just had bad luck on the issues of JRSSC that I looked at, because in, in other journals and in uh, both applied and theoretical, you see it everywhere. Not quite as Fisher wrote it, marginal likelihood Maximum likelihood, penalized likelihood, likelihood and score tests, likelihood ratio test, a variant of the maximum likelihood estimator. This is a paper from uh, 2021 in the Annals of Statistics, the second last paper by Eckville and Jones. They showed that their estimator was consistent. 2021, so 99 years after Fisher defined consistency, it's not that easy to show that every maximum likelihood estimator is consistent. Um, the, the distribution is easier than the consistency part. Um, and a related paper, small sample bias correction for the variance of the maximum likelihood estimator. We know that maximum likelihood estimator can be biased in small samples. This is the first paper I think I've seen that shows that the estimate of the variance also has some bias and it's worth correcting in certain settings. So that's some of the 21st century, but what all these papers have in common, well, have in common, common themes that ran through these papers, and I, I would say the ones in applied statistics as well. Data is messy now, uh, there's a lot of it, and it's very complicated. The, the more you have, the bigger the model you build. So everyone wants to max out the information in their data, right? So uh, 
if you have a lot of data, you think, oh, good, I can run a very complicated uh, model on this data and see what happens. Some of the common themes are spatial dependence, uh, nested sampling designs, high dimensional parameterizations. So I'll take a minute to talk about each of those. Ellen or, or John, I should see what, um, when should I stop talking? Okay, okay, uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, so in the case of spatial dependence, there's a very interesting construction that's used a lot, um, call it, uh, it goes by several names. Statisticians are absolutely terrible at naming things. But pseudo likelihood um, was the BSAG's name for it when he invented it in 1974. And it builds up the likelihood function from local characteristics. So this notation here means all the j's, all the y's that are neighbors of the one we're looking at. So we condition each point on its nearby neighbors. So you could think of a spatial model, for example. So each point is marked by an x, and then the distribution will be compounded by the conditional distribution of each x conditional on its near neighbors. In machine learning, they call it local characteristics. It's, there, there's a very simple example of a restricted Boltzmann machine, which is actually just a one single layer neural network, but you could have many other layers. And those are the distribution for those is also built up typically from local characteristics. And in, in this uh, version of the Boltzmann machine, if you use something like a logistic activation function, then each conditional distribution gets rid of a complicated term that is hard to work out so that the uh, pseudo likelihood is much more manipulable than the original likelihood. Um, with nested sampling designs, there's another notion of a sort of likelihood called a composite likelihood, originally named that by Bruce Lindsay. Uh, I've written it here in one of its forms um, and the idea is that we have each observation now is a vector and we have n of these vectors. And we want to analyze their dependence as we do in the spatial setting. Um, but it's hard to work out the joint distribution or the joint distribution of the whole vector might be quite messy. So we're just looking at margins, say pairwise margins of each two, two elements in the vector. I worked on, on this with David Cox in the early 2000s, and he came, I remember him coming into my office and writing this on the board, and I said, there's too many terms because each pair gets counted. Uh, y, the first component of Y goes with the second, third, fourth, fifth, and, and then it, so it gets counted many, many times and is, is so on with all the other components. Of course, that gets adjusted in the analysis, but at first sight, it looks like it shouldn't work, but it turns out that it does. Uh, it's very useful for things uh, where you have these time, time series or longitudinal data is an example where you're measuring uh, many correlated observations. And so I've got some scary math now to show the correlated observations. But the details aren't too important, but I want to show just the correlation. So suppose we have uh, some variable that we measure that's just a linear regression plus some random effects. So these, this will be some kind of a different intercept, say, for each, um, a, a different intercept for each person in the study. And we've measured each person many times. So there's going to be variation uh, within the people, and then variation, of course, across the different observations. So we're capturing this through, uh, say, a random intercept. And make the problem a bit harder by imagining we don't get to observe the Ws, but only whether they're positive or not. And then we model the probability that they're positive by some function of the random intercept and the uh, fixed regression part. OK. The likelihood for this is messy because we're, we, have, we don't see the Bs. They're random. So we have to integrate them out. So. It, Every time you have a complicated model, there's usually an integral somewhere, and the integrals can be hard. 
So this would take a long time, especially if we have a lot of bees, we'll have to do this, call it Q-dimensional integration. So the composite likelihood is also looks messy, but it really is extremely simple because it just has four possibilities. It's binary data. So you either see a one or a zero, and each Y is a one or a zero, so you see in pairs, you see two ones, a one and a zero, a zero and a one, and a two zeros. So that's just a multinomial likelihood for those four possibilities written in tedious notation. That's the composite likelihood. Uh, in high dimensional parameterizations, well, now we have, uh, these are sort of typical complicated examples where we have lots and lots and lots of parameters. Um, the gen uh, genetic array experiments are one example. Um, this second example from a paper in Buhlman, also based on genetic data, is trying to find gene-gene interactions and has represented it with a network. The point of this set of complications is that the parameters are very high dimensional and we saw already in the 20th century that when you have many nuisance parameters, it's, the likelihood function doesn't work terribly well because the, uh, the likelihood function can be defined, but the asymptotic approximations based on it don't work very well in practice. So what do we do when we have these modern examples where we've measured 30,000, um, taken 30,000 measurements on each patient, for example, um, and for that, there's, there's, well, there's a huge literature, absolutely vast. It's a very popular topic in statistics now. Um, and I've tried to describe a handful of strategies. Uh, one strategy is to get some new limit results. And they're just coming out now. This paper by Sir and Candace that I mentioned, I forgot to put the year, but I think it's 2017 or 2018. And the paper by Fan is maybe around the same time. Maybe slightly older than that, I'm not quite sure. Um, so this is, now these limiting results are like, n is going off to infinity, that's Fisher's limit. And now we have p, the parameter dimension, also going off to infinity. Depending how fast it goes to infinity, you can do one thing or another. Sir and Candace showed that if you let p grow with n linearly, that you never get rid of the bias in the maximum likelihood estimate and your variance estimate will be wrong as well. Uh, but they showed how to calculate that bias and the variance in certain special settings. So that's one approach to high dimensions. Um, another approach I wanted to mention, this is the work of a PhD student working under my direction in Toronto, uh, Dian Botang. Um, he studied the higher order approximations rather than the limiting normal approximations, but these, the fancy one that I was mentioning was a bit hard to work with. And he showed that uh, it would allow P to grow somewhat with N, but not too fast. So it's a little bit slower than the square root of N. The paper above is allowing P to grow linearly with N. So there is a kind of phase transition or something between those two cases, but I don't think it's understood yet. A more common approach that's been around for longer is to assume that most of the coefficients are zero in your very long parameter. So we have now theta has dimension 30,000, but most of those genes are not active in your sample, so you, you want to isolate the ones that are not zero, and that's um, sometimes usually referred to as an assumption of sparsity. So we assume that somewhere in there are some active thetas, and we have to find them. And you can find them in various different ways. You could enforce sparsity. That's what the lasso procedure does, if you've heard that buzzword. Uh, you can discover sparsity. That's a work um, that Heather's been working on, and also with David and with me to some extent. Um, and another approach is to isolate a parameter of interest and try to just zero in on what you know about that, somehow using that conditioning or marginalization that I mentioned before, 
to get rid of all the other 29,000 or 28,000 parameters. Um, there's kind of two different ways that we've looked at for that. Um, some students of mine worked on something called a directional test uh, as a way of eliminating nuisance parameters. And uh, uh, Heather and I approached it from a slightly different point of view. I, I'm being very high level because I, I know you don't want the gory details, but the, uh, I guess the take home message is that there's a wealth of things to be discovered as soon as you get away from the standard approach to asymptotic theory and we're only just starting. So this is, uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, various, well, I'm going to move along <laughs> to a second part. I didn't make an outline, so this is part two. Um, I've talked about all these things in blue, sort of, a high level, but I just want to mention that when I give my likelihood course, there's many, many other versions. Um, Semi-parametric, partial likelihood, as David Cox is famous for, um, empirical likelihood penalized versions, um, and many others. Why, why are there so many likelihoods? Uh, it's, it's a whole way of thinking about how to, how to start a new problem, because there's lots of new problems coming in the door, right? There's astronomy and sociology and psychology, and they've all, they're all drowning in data, and they all have interesting new problems, social networks, uh, distant galaxies, whatever. Um, so what do you do? Well, you try to figure out a mathematical model, and as soon as you do that, you're really drawn to writing down a likelihood function. If the model is complicated, so will the likelihood function be complicated, and then you look for ways to simplify it. But it's a strategy that you can use again and again, so it's a theory being tested against applications, and it's, it works. <laughs> okay, this is part two. I, I, have to mention those pesky p-values. There's been a lot of controversy in the statistical world about this. And, and I think any, any scientist has come up against, um, can, I'm, I'm going to need a p-value, and gosh, I hope it's less than 0.05. <laughs> so I'm going to just mention this in the context of the Andromeda trial, which got quite a bit of publicity at the time, about three years ago. So this trial estimated the hazard ratio of a new treatment for septic shock to be uh, less than one, but the 95% confidence interval on that ratio crossed one, and the two-sided p-value for testing that the two treatments were not different was 0 0.06. Uh, even though there was a fairly uh, large drop in uh, mortality rate. So the mortality went from 43% under the old treatment to 35% under the new treatment, which feels like a lot. But the study was kind of small, so it wasn't statistically significant. So in the discussion of the paper, the authors wrote that their new strategy did not result in a significantly lower 28-day mortality. But in the abstract and the headline, it said that the new treatment did not reduce 28-day mortality. And so these probably sound the same to a non-statistician, but to a statistician, they're, they're different. Um, that is, we couldn't show the difference was statistically significant. Um, but that's got translated into the new treatment isn't any good. And it obviously is, well, obviously, it seems promising. It depends on a lot of other things, right? What do we know about septic shock? Because I studied this example, it turns out septic shock is hard to treat. So uh, an 8% improvement in mortality is kind of promising. Uh, and the new treatment is actually easier to implement. So there are many things in its favor, which I guess is why the paper was published. But this um, eliding of statistical significance with practical importance is what plagues uh, p-values. Of course, many people have written many, many different things about how we could get around this. 
but I'm just going to focus on one version of that. Um, and that's uh, instead of reporting a p-value, let's report the whole function. So what I've shown you here is what, what Fraser called a p-value function, which is the probability of getting data as extreme or more extreme than this two by two table under various values of the hazard ratio, which is plotted across the bottom on the log scale. So that green arrow is pointing at zero. That's where there's no difference between the treatments. And you can see that the 95% confidence interval is just to the right of zero. The upper limit of it is just to the right of zero. So that's why the, the, they said there was no significant difference between the new and old treatment. And, but even so, I think when, when we look at a picture like this, the fact that it's so close to zero at the, that when we see the whole curve and see all the p-values we could have got, it somehow conveys something more intuitively, but also in some way, I think, um, statistically. So what, what I've done underneath the picture is something that David Cox suggested years and years ago, 1958, um, construct a set of nested <coughs> confidence intervals. And this p-value function that I've drawn is just another way of, of dis describing those nested confidence intervals. So you can see at 90% confidence, um, we are to the left of zero. At 95, we're not. And at 99, we're quite far away. So then it's just a fuller picture of what's involved. Now, uh, Fisher beat us to it <laughs> um, because in 1930, he tried to do exactly something like this, which he called inverse probability. Uh, and, and his inverse probability density is described in this rather mysterious notation, which he called the fiducial probability density for theta given a statistic y. Uh, much ink has been spilled over fiducial distributions there, um, then and even now, as I'll explain. But they are kind of confusing. And I, um, one thing about reading Fisher is that his, his language is very rich and it's interesting to read. So I, I like this quote that it's not to be lightly supposed that men, people of the mental caliber of Laplace and Gauss could fall into error on a question of prime theoretical importance. I think that should be encouraging to all students. OK, so back to the 21st century, there's a series of workshops on Bayes, frequentist, and fiducial inference. Um, the first one held in 2014, and the second one will be held uh, next week in, uh, in Toronto. Um, and I, I have this picture from a pub <laughs> somewhere in England that says, Beer, Food, and Friends. And there's a, there's a jazz group called uh, the Ben Folds Five. But this BFF stands for Bayes Frequentist Fiducial. And it's, uh, I, so I have the two columns. The left column is old, and the right column is many of the things that have been discussed in this series of workshops. And lots of new approaches to all these old topics. Um, but in particular, I wanted to let you know that there's quite a bit of interest now. I don't know, I don't know how practical it will turn out to be, but there's a lot of interest in looking at Fisher's fiducial probability from a new lens. The fiducial probability is a way to put a distribution on the parameter theta without putting a prior distribution on the parameter theta. So he rejected a Bayesian approach to this, but wanted to draw something like that distribution that I showed before. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the very quick explanation of modern approaches to fiducial inference. But just to describe that having a distribution on a parameter is, uh, I think the inference is somehow helpful and it particularly de-emphasizes these very arbitrary cutoffs. In Fisher's day, we needed arbitrary cutoffs because you had to look up the results in tables, but now the computer can look up all the results we need, so it's, it doesn't make sense anymore. And it's also 
kind of intuitively helpful that you, this is the point I was making about the green arrow hitting the zero really close to the end of the confidence interval. You somehow want to conclude that the parameter you're looking at is more likely to be in the middle of the interval than the outside. And fiducial is an attempt to do that. Okay, so uh, in, the, in, in that sense, all our inference statements become probability statements about unknown quantities. Now we have to look back at the foundations again because what do we mean by the probability statement? And most of the arguments about Fisher's work on fiducial were somewhat confused and confusing arguments about what the probabilities mean. They don't, fiducial probabilities aren't like normal probabilities. That is not like well, they're different because they can't be combined in the same way. So we have to then look at the nature of probability and the basically two approaches. One, the probability to describe physical haphazard variability in which the probabilities represent features of the real world. This is often called empirical or aleatory. And then the second, the probability to describe the uncertainty of our knowledge, and that's epistemic probability, and is usually associated with Bayesian inference. And I think to understand these distributions on parameters, we have to distinguish these quite carefully, which is also hard and, and requires thinking quite deeply about what types of things you're trying to measure. But I'd have to say that the discussions at the BFF that go in this direction tend to be pretty far away from the modern applications that I mentioned earlier. I'm gonna skip this and just mention, yes, what do we need in applications? Well, basically something that works and gives sensible answers is computable and not too sensitive to model assumptions. So I have one further example um, that I found in Nature, in, in a recent um, uh, issue of Nature, which uh, this is a small picture and kind of confusing, but it, there's more about it on the next slide. Uh, there, the picture is a little bit bigger, but let me go to the paper itself. The headline did att attract some attention because it says reproducible brain-wide association studies require thousands of individuals. Um, these are studies to relate population variability in brain features, such as functional connectivity, with behavioral phenotypes, such as cognitive ability. And the point of the paper was that, while brain imaging is very good for some things, for these brain-wide association studies of brain features with phenotypes, you need a lot of data. And the picture that I showed you is trying to drive that point home. And maybe the very bottom left picture, you see a little kind of cone going off to the right. And what's plotted up the left is the correlation that's been discovered in the studies. And what's plotted along the bottom is the sample size. And you can see that for small studies, like 25, the correlations, the statistical error could lead you to have correlations off by plus or minus 0.5. And many of these studies are that small, 23, 25, 27 patients, and, and the correlations that they're looking for are also very small, seem to be very small, and the statistical error is absolutely overwhelming the, uh, the, the, the interest in the parameter that they'd like to measure. So this is something Fisher would understand, right? This, in fact, he, in, in, deduced the, 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 the derived the distribution of the correlation coefficient. And he, although he would be shocked at the technology, the, the fact that you need more samples to reliably estimate a small correlation would have been something very familiar to him. This is a few more details about the study across all the univariate associations. The largest correlation that replicated was 0.16. And as I mentioned, the standard error is something like plus or minus 0.52. So you can see that it's even difficult to establish the sign of the effect, which direction it goes 
Finally, I have to mention, I, I said I, I enjoyed digging through the big book and reading some of Fisher's papers. They're beautifully written in some, in some respects. Um, but uh, another paper I could recommend with absolutely without reservation is Savage's paper from 1976 called On Rereading R.A. Fisher. This was a paper based on his Fisher lecture to the joint statistical meetings the year before. And in, in Savage's paper, he says, there's a world of R.A. Fisher at once very near to and very far from the world of modern statisticians. So I thought it was a beautiful encapsulation of, it's, it's difficult to read Fisher, but once you see it, it's so clear. Um, and, and so at the beginning of his lecture, he said that he wanted to kind of take people through that. Um, but he also mentioned that research for the fun of it is abundant and beautiful in Fisher's writings. And that really does come across as well, especially in the early papers where he was doing so much with special functions and distribution theory and so on. You could just, feels a bit like he's showing off, <laughs> but you could see the excitement of generating all these formulas and so on. In the discussion of Savage, Don had something interesting to say that I hadn't thought of before. He said an important characteristic of Fisher was his ability to move into new areas of statistics, suggesting concepts and methods. But that meant uh, that he left the theory open to modification and development. And that's very true. He kind of like sketch something and move on and sketch something and move on. And then what I haven't put here was, but what Don added was people go back and criticize him on particular points, but he was in some sense moving too fast for that. Um, start it, you guys finish it kind of thing. We don't r really allow people to do that anymore, and I think that's a loss. Uh, Brad Efron was another discussant of this paper, and he opened his discussant, uh, discussion with the sentence, this paper makes me happy to be a statistician. So I say uh, reading Fisher and presenting this talk made me happy to be a statistician. So I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and and uh, thank you for your attention today.